So we've got a, um, a presentation and then a series of case studies. And our first presentation is focusing on the changing economics of power options for mines. And it's my pleasure to introduce Sophie Liu. Sophie is head of metals and mining for Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Thank you, Adrian, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today to be able to speak with you. Uh, my name is Sophie Liu. I'm the head of a, a new team that Bloomberg NEF is building out um, to cover the metals and mining space. Uh, I think some, many of you are already quite familiar with our research, but just in case you haven't heard of us before, just wanted to do a very quick, brief introduction um, in the sense that I think Bloomberg NEF, many of you know us before as Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, just wanted to let you know that our name has changed. Uh, we are now Bloomberg NEF, so no more New Energy Finance. Um, and I think you'll be able to see from the types of, and the scope of the research that we cover the reason why for the name change. Um, traditionally, we have come from the clean energy space, um, but most recently, over the last three to four years, we've expanded rapidly in terms of our coverage for electrification of transport, autonomous driving uh, commodities, particularly oil and gas, um, and then um, going into different um, industries, uh, technology spaces like advanced materials and digital industry. And starting this year, we're also building out a new team focusing on um, the metals and mining space and chemicals. But um, to get to the topic of, uh, oh, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about our service and, um, and the, the research that we offer, I do encourage you to come up afterwards and speak with me or my colleague, Guillaume, who's sitting in the front. Um, and it would be a, a pleasure to be able to introduce ourselves more to you. For now, um, I wanted to get to the, the, the gist of what we promised to talk to you about today, which is essentially, um, you know, what are the future costs uh, for energy that you can expect um, in terms of designing your minds and in terms of uh, the long-term trends that we expect to see in the clean tech space, in the clean energy space. This is a message that we've been driving for a long time, which is that uh, renewable energy costs are really, really uh, coming down. And we've been saying for many years now that renewable energy will be cost competitive with traditional forms of energy. Um, basically, starting from last year, what we found is that this is no longer a future tense thing, it's a present tense thing. So cheap renewables in terms of their competitive level um, with uh, traditional sources of power or other types of energy is here. Um, you no longer have to wait for it. <laughs> um, and um, I think it's really quite obvious if you look at the trends that we've seen over the last 10 years or so in terms of the development of wind and solar technology, um, why this is the case. So the chart that you see there uh, in front of you is from our global LCOE report, Levelized Cost Electricity Report. It's something that we do twice a year. Um, it involves 46 countries and 7,000 projects and covering 20 different technologies. Um, every half a year, we update the com competitiveness of different technology across a different in order to see essentially how they've been progressing. Um, for the second half of this year, what we found was for our global PV, non-tracking um, uh, benchmark, so non-tracking PV, uh, the levelized cost of electricity has already dropped to $60 per megawatt hour. This is a 13% drop from the first half of the year. The main reason behind this is because of a massive slowdown in the solar market in China, which I'll go into a little bit more in detail in a minute. For global wind um, onshore, we're looking at a levelized cost of electricity of around $52 per megawatt hour. This is a 6% drop from the first half of the year. Um, and what's interesting is that um, much of what's driving the cheapest wind um, in the global market now is competitive auctions, particularly reverse auctions. Um, so we've seen um, prices in India and Texas uh, going down to as low as $27 per megawatt hour, which is uh, really quite, um, quite astonishing. Um, and across the board, what we found is that in, um, at least as a source of bulk generation, in almost all of the tier one markets that we, uh, that we ana an um, analyze and cover, solar and wind are now the cheapest source of bulk generation, um, with the um, exception of Japan. But despite the fact that costs have been coming down so rapidly for wind and solar technologies, what's interesting is that um, what we're seeing in 2018 is a drop in overall clean energy new investment. So we estimate that as of, the, as, as of Q3 of 2018, um, there has been about almost $68 billion invested into clean energy this year. This is down 6% from Q3 of last year. Um, so year to date right now, we're, all, we're only looking at about $211 billion invested into clean energy. Um, by the end of the year, we usually build in a little bit of a buffer because there's a lot of projects that actually are invested in this year but maybe are not announced until later. So we don't expect the numbers to have dropped 
nearly as much as they appear to be um, on the screen here, but there's no denying the fact that there was a slowdown this past year. There's a lot of key, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and there's a lot of drivers behind the reduction in cost that we see in so many of the different technologies. Now, to go into the story for uh, PV, for solar, um, the main reason was because there was a 40% drop in China's solar market this past year. Um, all of the results of what uh, we call the, the 531 May 31st policy, it was um, a bit of a shock to the market. I think many of you that watch the clean energy space probably heard about it. But essentially, regulators kind of... Um, it was a long time coming in terms of reckoning for the Chinese solar industry from regulators um, in terms of you know, how much they would continue to subsidize the development of utility scale solar and also distribute solar in their own home market. And um, basically the result was that they canceled the vast majority of subsidies um, and have announced that they may no longer be supporting as expansive build as originally expected. The result of this is um, we saw something around a 19% drop in the overall cost of PV modules across the supply chain. Um, and much of the cost has been absorbed by the supply chain manufacturers themselves. Um, there was a little bit of wiggle room in the industry before to absorb some of these costs, but um, the truth of the matter is for the Chinese solar supply chain um, industry, it is gonna be a lean two to three years um, while they sort of essentially wait for overcapacity to come around and also for new, um, new New demand to come up from other parts of, other parts of the world. Um, in terms of the wind space, uh, what we see is that, um, excuse me, so, so for solar, um, we are expecting um, a continuation of the experience curve. Um, so even though there's been this big one-time drop in the cost for PV modules because of the collapse of the Chinese market, um, it's still actually on the same relative schedule of the experience curve that we've been estimating for um, solar uh, PV module costs. So in case you're not familiar with the concept of experience curves from Bloomberg and EF, traditionally we've looked at it in the sense of what are the cost um, declines that you can expect in the industry for every doubling of installed capacity of that technology. So for solar, we're still expecting 20 8.5 percent for um, a, a reduction in cost for every doubling of capacity. In the wind turbine space, the cost reductions that we see in turbines are um, much slower, um, but uh, essentially the per unit costs of turbines are decreasing very quickly, and the main reason is because of a rapid growth in capacity factors. So we used to be looking at um, uh, wind turbines that could handle a smaller amount of capacity, but now increasingly we're talking about the new turbines that could be essentially generating 40 to 60 percent ranges going into the future. Um, another major factor that's contributing to the cost uh, in declines of wind is the smarter and more efficient operations. So after about 10 years of operational data from many of the global uh, sort of onshore wind farms, um, what they're able to do is to um, sort of conduct better analysis on much of this operational data, and they've been able to achieve much better efficiencies of, um, of, um, uh, of operations. Um, okay, so then uh, when we're looking at coal and gas as well as a source of energy generation, um, one of the sort of, I, I guess, complaints that we've had in the past is, um, do you also account for the efficiency gains that, are, that can be expected in the coal and gas uh, generation sector as well? And we do. So um, this year we recently did um, a forecast looking into essentially what are the future operational efficiencies that we can expect, expect for car thermal, coal thermal plants and um, CCGT combined gas turbines. And um, what we found was after looking at about 70 years of operational historical data for coal power plants, um, even when you're looking at ultra high voltage um, supercritical, uh, excuse me, supercritical, ultra supercritical coal plants going into the future, um, we're still expecting to see only about a 3.7 um, gain in efficiency for coal power plants for every doubling of capacity. And for CCGT, we're expecting about a 2.7% gain in efficiency by 2050. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to move a lot faster. <laughs> um, another one of the major areas that we looked at this year was um, we decided to incorporate um, different kinds of um, generation into our analysis. And the main area here is that we really wanted to incorporate the levelized cost of electricity of flexibility. So what is the competitiveness between battery generation, um, gas reciprocating engines, 
uh, OCGT and CCGT, especially as they are ramped up according to their ramp up speed. Because um, what happens is people who are operating in the power markets, they both value the generation for their ability to contribute in capacity, as well as their ability to uh, contribute to rapid response and flexibility. And what we found was across the board, um, batteries are, um, especially lithium ion batteries, are still the cheapest source of flexibility uh, compared to uh, gas plants. Um, and this is largely driven by the fact that we're expecting a um, close to 50% reduction in the overall stationary storage system costs uh, from now until 2030, especially as EV manufacturing drives down the cost of lithium ion battery packs. So um, we are, uh, that's going to really fundamentally change the future of what uh, energy stacks can look like in different markets. So for Australia, for instance, where mining is a major, uh, major portion of the economy and um, a large sort of consumers of electricity and energy in general, what we found was that when you're looking at dispatchable generation, um, you're actually uh, onshore wind plus storage and PV plus storage are already economically competitive in these markets. So you are looking at you know, stable, full, full, fully supplyable systems that if you develop now will actually be uh, uh, just as cost competitive as developing um, other alternatives. And then if you're looking at only peaking capacity or only sort of fast response reliability capacity, then, um, then utility scale batteries are still within the same range essentially as alternatives like um, gas reciprocating engines and OCGT. Um, a very quick state of play for mining and renewables. Uh, what we found was that uh, we looked at about uh, two gigawatts of 100 uh, renewable projects that are associated with some of the top 40 publicly listed mining companies or mines around the world. And um, did just a quick breakdown in terms of uh, what are the projects and how they are in terms of technology and region. Uh, what we found was that the vast majority of projects are currently located in the North and South Americas. And um, much of it is, in terms of capacity is driven by several off-site large wind off-ticker agreements. Um, um, and then in terms of structures, very noticeably is starting in 2014, many of the mining procurement of renewables has moved towards a offsite um, third party PPA sort of off taker agreement. Um, this is a trend that we expect to see to continue and I look forward to maybe speaking with some of you in the room later today to hear about what your thoughts are in the future of renewable procurement room for mines. Um, and then um, these are the different kinds of strategies that miners are considering. Given sort of time considerations, I'm going to move relatively quickly through the next bit, but um, essentially we wanted to also introduce the fact that um, renewable energy is actually very much in line with some of what's happening in the future of um, technology adoption that's happening in the mining space. So, um, you know, so as many of you know already, many, uh, the cost of production for mines have been growing over the last few years due to sort of the complexity of the geography that they're operating in or um, because of increasing regulations around safety or environment, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's been, we've noticed a growth in the sentiment of uh, mining companies in terms of the amount of times that they mentioned digitalization, automation, or drones or those kinds of um, different technology buzzwords um, in, their, um, in their public documents. Um, this increasing sentiment is also accompanied uh, by the fact that technology uh, has really reached the point now where uh, you're looking at a much easier adoption rate for um, drones or other or um, UAVs or other kinds of um, technology in your overall uh, operational um, uh, structure. So we've noticed, for instance, that hardware miniaturization is really driving down the overall heaviness of much of the equipment. Um, drones, for instance, are uh, have improved in range rapidly. We expect by 2030 the range of, of typical industrial drones will have doubled. Um, and then the most important thing is software improvement. Um, AI and essentially better uh, data analytics is, is rapidly increasing the accuracy of um, the information that's collected by these automated um, uh, technologies. Um, so drones that are capturing um, essentially uh, pictures as they're flying across your facilities are now through the improvement of their software more capable of identifying correctly when there are places that are in need uh, for maintenance upgrades or um, if they're doing for instance uh, resource surveys etc. 
Um, another thing that's probably making it easier to adopt these technologies in your industry as well is the fact that there's just better services being provided. Um, and there's full packages, um, including, for instance, DAAS drones as a service, which where you can basically pay a subscription fee to get access to an entire fleet of drones that's fully managed for you. You don't even have to deal with the operational costs, et cetera. I'm not gonna go into super detail here because I think many of the providers are actually in this room and they can probably tell you better the services that they plan on giving. Um, and then, of course, in terms of the renewables and off-grid space, um, this is also a major area for development, and we've noticed over the last two or three years that many of the suppliers in this space are now gaining um, quite a bit of experience um, in terms of providing these solutions, and therefore it's not as experimental as it used to be, and it's become a much more reliable backup option, um, especially when it's mixed in with existing, um, re uh, existing sort of um, on-site backup energy resources. Okay, and then finally, I just wanted to end a note on hydrogen because I know that this is <laughs> something that everybody in the energy space, everybody in the industry space has been really particularly focused on. Um, we had a Shanghai summit um, just last month in, uh, for Bloomberg NEF where it was basically the only thing everybody talked about. Um, it is a very interesting option, um, especially if you are looking at being able to do large scale industrial applications where uh, maybe electricity will not be enough to meet that need. However, we do want to caution, right, that there are some serious limitations to what hydrogen can do at the end of the day. The first one, of course, is that it is still incredibly expensive to make. So what we estimate is that right now to produce hydrogen from renewable electricity, because remember, you can't just produce hydrogen from scratch, you have to actually use energy to produce energy, so it's kind of a secondary energy source. Hydrogen from renewable energy right now, we estimate costs about 32 to $41 per gigajoules. Um, in comparison, if you, were to comp if you were to produce unclean hydrogen from fossil fuels, you're looking at a 15 to $20 cost, so about half the cost if it was produced from renewables. And then finally, if you were just simply to use natural gas instead of hydrogen, you're looking at um, only a third or even a fourth of the cost of what it'd be to produce hydrogen. So this is something to kind of keep in mind that um, hydrogen in itself takes energy to produce, um, and so therefore will automatically make it less efficient and more expensive to make unless there are some major breakthroughs in terms of how this can be done. Um, or other utilization um, to consider besides just as a pure sort of uh, energy source. So for instance, heat or um, kind of other industrial inputs. Um, this was the projected demand for hydrogen um, that was released by the Hydrogen Council, but they're expecting by 2050. And just to put this into perspective, everybody, this requires 29,250 terawatt hours of generation and 9.5 terawatts of generation capacity in order to produce this amount of hydrogen. This is what we estimate anyways. That is more than the current global generation capacity and nine times the current installed wind and solar capacity as of the end of 2018. So I leave you on that note. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. We have uh, three minutes, so if there is a question for Sophie in the audience. Uh, Torsten Preugschers from Zoventix. Uh, one question on your page number four, where you show the downgoing prices for wind and solar. Um, first of all, um, I'm since 20 years inside the solar industry, and I have my doubts that solar will become uh, cheaper in the future because we're already matching prices for solar modules what are in comparison to the raw material inside the panel. So from this aspect, we from our side as EPC and uh, project developer, we don't see a huge potential of reduction of prices of solar so far. And we would also see no opportunity to, uh, to match this because solar is already the cheapest resource. Right. Where are your expectations that the solar prices are moving down or coming from? That's a very good question. Um, so much of what we saw in the 19% reduction in um, PV uh, cost this year and the resulting 11% drop in LC... 14% drop in, in, in LCOEs was actually mostly from the supply chain. So as a developer, many of the margins in terms of solar developers is already very tight, so I completely agree with you on that. Um, um, in markets like China, for instance, many of the project developers um, considered optimistic to expect returns of 5 to 8% on their on the projects that they develop. However, on the supply chain, depending on what part of the module supply chain you are in, um, or even in the inverter market, um, some of the suppliers were still experiencing 14 
10 to 14 percent returns on their on their sort of overall production capacity. Um, and what we've spoken with um, a lot of the, especially the Chinese suppliers after the 531 uh, impact of the policy is many of them are basically duking it out to own the market into the future, and they're very much willing to uh, absorb and accept short-term costs. To, um, I'm sorry, short-term um, losses. So many of them over the next two or three years are looking at maybe four to five percent in terms of the returns on their on their on their investments. Um, but many of them hope that you know by after 2020, once the market is consolidated and the supply chain is a little bit more stable, um, that they should be able to return up. So we do expect that the re cost reductions in solar will slow down. But as you say, it's already the cheapest energy source in the world. So in terms of um, in terms of there being major more significant declines in solar costs that's needed. Um, it really, I think, will rely a lot more on essentially financing costs coming down um, and then also any sort of efficiency gains where the technology itself for every unit of production just simply, you know, it's, it's about, it's a kind of a scale game after that in terms of the capacity. Does that, yeah? Yeah, thank uh, Thank you. Uh, one point to this, because on your page number four, there were four curves for, for downgrading prices for, for energy uh, capacity. Uh, all of them are linear except solar because that was logarithmic. If you already show it in the, in the linear uh, scope, you see that we are entering to a, uh, to a lemus for, for, for solar already, right. and that would make it a little bit more visible. Right, right, yeah, but the solar scale is logarithmic, you're correct, yes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.